Welcome to season 13 of the Parenting Aces podcast, a proud member of the Tennis Channel Podcast Network. I'm your host, Lisa Stone, and today we've got something a little different for you. I am out at the Easter Bowl at Indian Wells Tennis Garden and am going to be interviewing several different people out here to kind of get their take on the Easter Bowl, what's going on in junior tennis, and what the various roles are of the people on site here. So I hope you enjoy my conversation with Colette Lewis of Zoo Tennis, J.Y. Obone, who is one of the coaches out here, Jack Newman, another coach out here, and Rex Kuhlman, who is one of the 12 and under boys players out here. I had a great time chatting with everybody, and I think it's gonna be a fun one for y'all. First up, I have Colette Lewis of Zoo Tennis, and I've been trying to get her to sit down with me for the last three weeks. We've been at all these different events together, which has been such a treat for me. So I hope you enjoy hearing from Colette. Colette, I have gotten to see you three weeks in a row. What a treat. <laughs> Twice out here in the desert, once in San Diego. You have had a long stint out here in SoCal. Can you kind of give our audience a little bit of your insight as to the differences between the ITF tournament that was here during the BMP Paribas Open, the ITF that was down in San Diego, and now Easter Bowl back out here at Indian Wells. There's a lot of differences. It, it, it is kind of um, interesting to, to see them. Of course, the ITF here at Indian Wells is the second week of the BMP, so it, it's like a junior slam for the kids, especially those who have never played it and have never been it at a site where all the pros are playing in the big stadiums, they're hearing the roars, you know, they're seeing them practice um, in the courts next to them. So um, th that's a real thrill and, and very comparable to a junior slam. Um, and the, the quality of players generally uh, quite high. I, th I think last year it was a North American closed. This year it went full international. They didn't probably get as many international players as they wanted, but I think is when they get that word out that you know an Indian Wells qualifying wild card is is the carrot here. They might get a few more, um, but it's a long trip from from Europe for one one tournament. So. We'll see if, if it expands and becomes more globally desired. But um, it was it was a very nice tournament, and the kids are just thrilled when they get to play at Stadium Two and you know just get the big time. You know the ball runners and the MC and and the music and the flash and their names <laughs> and the <laughs> neon and all all the stuff that happens here. Yeah, they and got, in the app. <laughs> Which is really yes. fun. Yeah, and, and they are um, treated well here. And so, I, you know, that, that tournament, it, we kind of start at the top, to be quite honest with you, because they had chair umpires and live scoring from, from the first round. And uh, things that you, you, except for the slams and maybe the uh, J500s, uh, like the Orange Bowl, you, you just don't get a junior tennis. It's, it's too expensive. To provide those things, um, San, then the next week in San Diego, many of the same kids played, but it was a North American close this year, which was a switch uh, from last year, which will be permanent. Um, so that was confined to basically Canadians and Americans, and um, obviously the, then the fields aren't quite as strong. You won't get any international players unless they have the immigration status to play there and um, it was it was fine the weather was good um, for for San Diego where we had really bad weather last year but it's Barnes is a very nice site it's got a lot of courts but you know there there's a lot going on there as well in the afternoons they tend to play everything at the same time which is not ideal you get a few college coaches there most of them don't come here just from the logistics of, of getting to the BMP and you know the crowds and everything but um, San Diego University of San Diego has a tournament so I see college coaches there when, when their teams are 
um, playing in in a small spring break tournament for, for college players. So you see a few college coaches there watching players that have already committed or looking at people, uh, boys and girls from 2005, 2006, you know, um, recruiting classes. So uh, that makes it a little bit different um, to have college coaches in the realm. And then, um, yeah, it, it's just, just, you know, much smaller, much more low key. There's no signage. There's nothing to say you're at a big time special tournament. So, um, yeah, that that was uh, San Diego. And then you come back here, and the Easter Bowl has a brand, and it's had a brand for a long, long time. And um, whether the fields are strong, and they're really in the 18s, they're not going to be because they're. Uh, it's not an ITF anymore. Two years ago, um, after Alex Mickelson won it, Mr. Top 100 <laughs> now, um, two years ago, that was the last year it was an ITF event. And so a lot of kids that are playing the two weeks prior in order to get into slams um, this summer well, wouldn't play here for a third week. We, we have a few that are playing all three weeks, mm -hmm. but not very many of them. So. Um, the fields are less, but it's in SoCal, so a lot of the kids in SoCal who don't play ITFs will sign up for this and come and play here. And, uh, you know, they're familiar with the venue and, and they like it. And the Easter Bowl has been out here for, you know, several decades now. So it, it's a big deal. And, of course, for the 12s and 14s, <laughs> amazingly fun for them to get on these, on, on these grounds. and. Yeah. And to get a chance to pick, play and, and see what's going on here, so um, a USTA event is different, but um, just from uh, the sheer size of this, um, four age divisions, that sort of thing. Right. So um, it's really fun to talk to the kids because they're they're so when they get a big win, it's just so big for them to you know to beat somebody at the Easter Bowl. Yeah, yeah, so. I love that. The So you mentioned that the Easter Bowl has the 12s, 14s, 16s, 18s age divisions versus the last two events, which were ITFs, so everybody plays in the same draw. Do you always find your 12-year-olds and your 14-year-olds that you like to watch and you, you know, think are going to have a, a nice stint in junior tennis and maybe beyond? And I, I try not to, as Joel Drucker would say, speculate too right. much, but you're right. You do find players that you're like, oh, I like that player's game. I'm going to pay a little bit more attention to him or her going forward just because you like the way they play. Um, is, it, it, is it style? Is it behavior? Is hmm. it... What is it? Yeah, it's both, actually. Uh, some kids have a great game, and, and they're... And I'm one of those people that's not into all the hype and emotion and, you know, kids having trouble controlling themselves. But I totally understand um, <laughs> why that happens. They're kids, yeah. you know, and, and they're still learning the skills that, that it will take to control themselves when they need to and then not burn all the energy, you know, after every point and that sort of thing. But there's no question. I, I'm a... I come from the Bjorn Borg School of Tennis, so Chris Everett, you know, it's just like stoic is better. I, I really like those kind of kids. Do you prefer watching the older age divisions here, the younger age divisions? Do you have a preference one way or the other? Yeah, that, that's a, that's, the tennis is obviously better at the, in the 18s. Um, and it, it is difficult sometimes to watch the 12s, though so they're amazing players. Um, finishing points is always going to be a struggle for those kids. They just don't have the power um, to be able to to take advantage of an opening when they get it. Yeah. <laughs> and it's still fun to see. It's still tennis and it's still very high quality tennis, but it's very interesting by the time they get to the 14s, that's kind, that, that's kind of a skill that you have to have by then. If you, if you can finish a point when you've got the opportunity, the other person is just going to, you know, torment you. So, <laughs> so, um, yes, I know about that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I, 
but I do enjoy seeing kids, um, you know, do new, new kids all the time, finding uh, people that, uh, youngsters that are interested in, in the game and how they see the game and, and what kind of things they, they do uh, to help themselves, to concentrate, to focus. You know, it's, it's just really interesting to, to watch the process. And then you can also watch their um, results not just the results, but just how they've improved over the years. I mean, you can see some kids that were maybe, you know, starting to emotionally regulate by the time they're in the 14s when they were unable to do that in the 12s or, you know, kids that you always thought, oh, they're, you know, they're crazy or they're, you know, they're <laughs> never gonna, it's too hard on them. Yeah. Tennis is too tough for them emotionally. And that they figure it out and they say, if I wanna play and I wanna continue to play at a high level, then I'm gonna have to, you know, find a way to not be so dramatic. And they do. So, and then there are others that are who they are when they're 10 or 11 years old and that's not gonna change. Yeah. But. It's really fun to see the growth and, and the changes in a, in a player's mental and and their also their games themselves. Yeah. Like parenting aces, zoo tennis is pretty much self-funded. What keeps you coming back for all of this? <laughs> Traveling across the country, reporting. Every, I mean, you don't miss a day. You you no, post an article every single day, whether it's junior tennis, college tennis professional players right. that you've been following since they were juniors right. <laughs> what what inspires you to keep doing this I just I, I just really enjoy it I and I feel like I am contributing something to the world of tennis which is is you know a reason to do anything but I I really I enjoy it we're in the most some of the most beautiful places in the world you know we're in Miami in December and we're here in, in Indian Wells in March and you know we'll be at Wimbledon in in the summer and the US Open and Kalamazoo of course where I'm from all of the the great um, places in tennis history uh, we get to go to and see so um, I've always loved to travel so that's not a negative for me somebody asked me yesterday a, a parent of a player if I was eager to get home because I'm in week three and I'm like no <laughs> Have you looked at the weather in Kalamazoo? <laughs> um, this is pretty nice. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Well, it's always a treat to see you and uh, to read your insights. And I, I don't know if I've ever told you this, but I, I do consider you my mentor. And I, you know, I learn from you every time I read something that you've written or speak with you or just watch you at an event. So. Thank you for continuing to be out here and, and giving a voice to junior tennis and making it relevant, seriously. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for all you do for junior tennis as well. Yeah. Well, see you next trip. <laughs> all righty. Thank you. <laughs> next up is Rex Kuhlman, who is in the boys' 12s, and he is someone that I have kind of known for a couple years now. His parents are great members of Parenting Aces community and I got to watch Rex play today and chat with him after his quarterfinal match. Hey Rex, you just won your semifinal match, right? Quarterfinal. Quarterfinal match. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's Quarterfinal fine. match um, in the boys' 12s. Congratulations. Thank you. How is the tournament going so far? It's going good. I mean, you know, I haven't really had many tough matches. I've lost three games so far. So tomorrow I'm playing a kid that I've never been before. I've lost him twice. So I think I've been playing good, but tomorrow I'm excited for a really good challenge. You're the three seed in the tournament. How does that impact kind of your mindset getting ready for matches? I mean, it doesn't really impact my mindset at all because I, I do my warm up the same. I still hit before matches. I still play matches with the same intensity and attitude. So I don't think it impacts me at all. I think it's just a number by my name. Okay, I love that. You're here with your parents and your coach, JY. 
How is it having JY here at the tournament with you? I know you live in Florida, JY lives up in Atlanta, and y'all wor have worked together, you know, for a while now, but you don't get to see him every day. So what does it mean to have him here, and, and what kind of stuff are y'all doing or talking about between your matches? I mean, like, it's really great to have him here because since he lives in Atlanta, you know, sometimes when I play tournaments in Atlanta or I go up there for, like, small training blocks, I'll see him, but I don't get to see him every week. So it's really nice to get the opportunity to be coached by him and for him to share some of his insight with me. And I think, like, between matches, like, I'm working on, like, flattening out my forehand and accelerating a little bit. And, you know, we're always tinkering with little stuff to see how I can improve my game between matches without making too big of a change. And, yeah, I think he's a really amazing coach. I love that. I understand that there's something about molten lava cake. Could you tell us a little bit about that deal? I like anything chocolate and whipped cream, and it has generally both, so... <laughs> Yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Well, but you have a deal with JY about it. Oh, so the deal is if I hit, like, if I flatten out some forehands, if I flatten out, like, if each forehand equals $5, what I, like, I have to do a certain amount to get a molten lava cake. <laughs> like, whatever the cost is, if it's $25, five flat forehands. I love it. With pace, of course. With pace. And so tell us a little bit about what your everyday looks like when you're at home, when you're not at a tournament. Um, usually I wake up, have breakfast, and then I'll go usually do a training session, a hitting session. And then so usually after that I'll have fitness, like 30 minutes after that or something. And then I'll probably go to like a Panera for a lunch or something some pasta and chicken maybe chicken noodle soup um and then you know maybe like usually like I'm gonna say like two o'clock I hit in the afternoon and then by the time I'm done at with tennis sometimes I have like stretching class on this um it's this website called out school that like has a lot of classes you can do stretching class art class a lot of things and I do those every Wednesday and Friday. And when I'm not, I do, sometimes I go to a physio or acupuncturist, or sometimes I just do stretches they've told me to do. And where does school fit in? Uh, homeschool, I basically do that during lunch, sometimes in the morning a little bit, sometimes in the afternoon if I need to do more. Gotcha, gotcha. And tell us what you love about being at the Easter Bowl. Is this your first Easter Bowl? Uh, second. Second Easter Bowl. Okay, tell us what you love about this tournament. I like the Easter Bowl because I think it's cool, you know, not just playing at Indian Wells when you're playing there or like getting to, you know, play like literally two weeks after Indian Wells, but I think it's really you know, just really nice to see all people around the country, California, middle states, eastern, Florida, southern, I mean, many more sections. And I think you can make some really cool friends. And I think, like, it's a great opportunity and it's one of the most prestigious tennis events for juniors. And you've got doubles later today. Yes. Um, how does doubles kind of fit in? Like, is that something you do for fun? Is it something that you take as seriously as you take your singles? Um, I'd say, like, I do do it, like, for fun. Like, I do singles for fun. I wouldn't play tennis if I didn't enjoy it. But I think, honestly, like, I think doubles is just another opportunity to work on singles since that's what really matters to me the most. But I do care about doubles a lot. And you're playing with one of your buddies this yes, week? Yes, David. Yeah. And do y'all train together? How do y'all know each other? Um, so we used to live in New York together. Um, we didn't train together, and we still don't. But we knew each other from New York. Sometimes we'd hit. And then he moved to Florida. I moved to Florida like a year later. And sometimes we do like practice that's like once a month or something or sometimes we like go to the beach together or something 
So he's a good friend of mine, yeah. I love that. Well, wishing you the best of luck in your next round singles and later today in doubles. If I'm still around, I'll come cheer you on. But it's been great to see you. Thank you. Now enjoying my chat with Coach J.Y. Oboning. He is coaching Rex and another player out here this week. And y'all know J.Y. from the podcast. He's been on several times. So I hope you enjoy hearing his perspective on this great tournament. Jay White, you're coaching here at the Easter Bowl back as a junior coach, but first time you came here was as a player. Yeah, I mean, that's what, 23 years ago, something like that. I, yeah, for, I came for 12s as well. So. I love it. Yeah. I love it. And how is the tournament different or the same as it was when you were here as a kid? Uh, I guess it, it's very much the same, which is awesome because this is one of the most beautiful places in the country. The weather's been amazing. Um, so peaceful out here. That's probably something I didn't enjoy as much as a player. Yeah. You know, you're so high strung, worried about your matches, and at least I get to enjoy it, you know, the beauty of this place. So it, it definitely enjoying it more this time around. <laughs> I love that. You're coaching two players in the boys 12s, yeah. and neither of them live where you live. Yeah. So can you talk a little bit about the challenges and the benefits of having a long distance relationship with your players and how y'all all have made that work. Well, I think it's refreshing for everybody because you just don't, you know, you see somebody every single day, you can get a little tired of, I don't care who you are, I don't care how much you like them. You, it's, it's nice to have a little break from everybody. So I think that helps us when we get here. It's, it's, it's new energy, fresh air. Um, we're excited to get to work together because again, we know we don't get too many opportunities. Uh, and at the same time, you know, we communicate well with the coaches back at home. So I mean, we're all working on the same page. I watch, you know, they send me their matches on tournaments. They send me their tournament matches via Swing Vision. So I, I know I'm tracking their progress. I know everything and it's just, and then we just merge everything and I can maybe provide a different perspective or reinforce like, hey, nope, you're, yeah, your coaches are, they're doing everything perfect. Like no need to question them, they're doing, these, these boys don't question them, but you know, it's nice to have an opinion that uh, from the outside in that's like, yeah, we're all good. So you're here, the kids' parents are here. Your role is exactly what during a tournament like this? Uh, coach, to the player, to the parent, <laughs> uh, and you know, just helping them organize their schedule as well, like understanding, you know, they're both in doubles as well. Um, so just understanding, hey, well, you know, when, when should we eat? When should we play? When should we do everything? When should we warm up? Like yesterday was kind of a weird day. Match is starting at 5 p.m. So how do you manage the entire day, right? It's, uh, well, got a little nap in, hit twice, actually, not just once. So organizing all that and then also just look, getting ready for the matches. How are you going to play? How are you going to handle certain moments? What's your strategy? Plan A, plan B. But and then also getting back ready for the next one too. One of the boys lost. So it's like, okay, I know it hurts, but like we got to get back and play another match. So mm -hmm. just put a, a lot of different hats on. <laughs> and I mean, I've also seen you interacting with the parents as well. So I know that you know, you and I have talked about this quite a lot, that the role of a great coach doesn't just involve coaching the child, but also involves coaching the parents on what this journey is supposed to be and what the parent's role is in supporting their child through the journey. What are some things that you're learning the more you do this? Because you're still, you're pretty young in terms of your coaching journey. Um, but come to it from a lifetime in the sport. So you bring a lot of experience. Yeah, I think the, the, the benefit for me that is that it, they're not my kids. So I'm a little bit more emotionally detached from it. I can see the process more for just the process. And I think this is something I'd mentioned to you in the past, you know, now that I'm a father, like I can see how, you know, even if you know the process, like in starting to learn things, when it's your kid, it's just so much harder. Uh, and even some of these parents have had kids that go through it or maybe they went through it themselves. It's just harder when it's your kid. So I can provide an unemotional response to things that is unbiased. That's simply just about what's best for the player. And, you know, I think that helps bring, you know, just a clarity on what's going on because when our emotions get in the way, you, things kind of seem a little bit more gray and blurry. So 
I think that's the biggest help for me with parents is me watching. And there's a lot of things that I've seen go on at these tournaments with these kids because this is our second tournament in a row. So now I've seen them play against different level players in different scenarios, different weather conditions, wins, losses. Um, and But not only that, how they're handling the conversations before and after, what were they doing before the match? So yeah, I mean, there, there's a lot that we're, we're doing out here and um, yeah, I'm just happy to be here to help. Yeah, I love that. Um, switching gears kind of slightly, we've got this virtual conference that we're putting on in June and you're gonna be one of our speakers at the conference and I'm super excited about that. And I, I hope that our audience is paying attention to this because we've got an incredible day set up for all the parents and players out there. But one of the things that you're gonna be speaking on at the conference is how to choose a coach, how to choose a facility that is right for for that particular player. Understanding that just because it's the same family, if they're multiple kids, the same coach may not be the right coach for multiple kids. So can you kind of give us a little of your philosophy around, just briefly, around choosing the right coach, choosing the right facility for somebody that's just starting the journey? Just teasing our session a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I think it's, you have to clearly define, well, what's your child's goal? First and foremost, like how competitive do they want to take this journey on? Because then that that right there decide helps you decide where am I going to take this? You know, how serious, there's so many different programs in the country. Some are more recreational, some are more competitive, some are bigger, some are smaller. So you have to know exactly what you're looking for and then try to find the right fit. And also what's the best environment for your kid? Um, how self-disciplined are they? Because men, if they're not, then if they get thrown into a mix of a big program, which big programs are fine, but maybe for some kids, they, they need more attention from where they are in their journey. So you have to know, okay, what exactly do we want out of this? Then you know what to look for. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the conference, we'll say what specific things you should look for within right. that journey. Now I can't give, give you all the answers now. <laughs> no, just um, a teaser, just a teaser. Yeah, just, just a teaser. Uh, and then from there, you, you have to know, okay, what's a good environment for my kid? Mm -hmm. uh, where do they learn best in? And with the final thing being, you know, being willing to change, you know, great coaches don't always mesh with everybody. I'm not the best coach for every player. I, you know, there's other kids I am better with. We get along better, we hear, we speak the same language, so it's easier. It's, it's okay if you decide to go to a great place, but it just didn't work for your child. Mm -hmm. That happens. Yeah. So just being flexible and learning and being willing to just adapt as the journey goes on. Speaking of, I mean, the first thing you said is having a clear understanding of what your child's goals are. And I love that you were very specific about the child's goals, not the parent's goals for the child. There are kids that get involved in tournaments that it turns out don't really like competing, don't really like the daily grind of what it takes to be successful in junior tennis. What do you say to parents who are starting to see that, or maybe they're not seeing it, but you're seeing it in the child? Well, the first thing I try to figure out is I, I, I take it, okay, let's just say they, I want to try to help them be, they're saying they want to be competitive, they're showing something different. First, I need to answer, is there something internally, some sort of pressure that they have on themselves that this is why they don't like competing, that maybe if we can remove that pressure or we can change their perspective on what to look for out of the competition and they can see things differently, maybe they start to enjoy it more. So that's the first approach I try to take. I don't wanna take them out of it first. I wanna see, is there something else going on that really needs more attention than that? Mm -hmm. uh, and then if we do hit the nail and we figure that part out and they're still just not competing the way I think a happy competitor is, someone who's truly in love with just leaving it all out there, then I just gotta say like, hey, let's maybe take a different approach with how we decide where we wanna take this journey. And that's where usually, the best way to do that to really find out is give the child a lot more power in decisions. Mm -hmm. Yes, I understand that to a certain degree, kids need help, you have no experience, but there is a certain age and experience where you can, hey, why don't you put together a tournament schedule? Hey, why don't you tell me when you wanna practice and play a practice match? And, 
then you start to find out, well, hey, hey, they're asking to play a tournament every week, but they, I thought they, they hated it. So maybe there's something there. Or maybe it's like, you know, they haven't asked about a tournament in two months. All right, you don't, you don't need to worry about it anymore. You're getting the answers just by giving them power and letting them decide what they want. So that's the, the way I try to take those things. I love it. One last question. Your kids are still in the doubles, and so they've both just played singles matches. They've got a doubles match later this afternoon. What do you do or tell them to do in between the matches to recover from the singles, but then get pumped back up to compete in the doubles? So we have just enough time where I said, hey, try to eat as fast as you can, because the, the faster you get food in, the, the better you're gonna be able to recover, but then also try to sneak a nap in, you know, because uh, one of these kids was up at six in the morning today, 8, 8 a.m. matches. So trying to, that's where you recover well. So if they have time, to, even if it's 30 minutes, go take a nap, get out of here. Stop, don't, stop watching matches. I know it's a social time, but we have to play later. And then also I'll shorten the recovery time here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I won't do as much stretching now because we're gonna play again later anyway. We'll just do a good dynamic warm up. But then that's where at the end of the day, I know it's going to be a little bit late. That's where I'll take him to the gym, try to get him on the bike for 15 to 20 minutes to flush out the lactic acid, then have a, a nice cool down. Um, but really just try to give him almost like a mental break right now because it, it's been a long day for the kids. It's been a long week. I mean, they've been at this since Saturday and traveled across the country to get here. So yeah. managing all that is very challenging, especially for 11, 12 year old kids. That's why I say I'm, I'm a bit of a manager out here, right? I'm, I'm not teaching these kids anything new. I'm not going to change forehands or backhands. I, it's hard for me because I want to fix it, but yeah. I got what I got, and I know in the middle of the tournament I'm not going to change anything. It's, they're not going to be able to do it. So it's like how can I keep them with as much great energy and as much motivation throughout the week because then they'll play better. So managing the time appropriately so they don't feel like it's been a long week. Mm -hmm. So they feel like they've been able to get some rest and some break but also still see their friends and hang out. If I can balance that as well as I can, they're gonna be happy staying out here as long as possible. And then they'll play well. Yeah, love it. Thanks for chatting. It's always great to get you on the other side of the microphone, but even greater to finally meet you in person. Yes, I'm glad I could you know, share a coffee with you and finally do this. It's been way too long. Absolutely. Thanks, good luck to the boys this afternoon. Thank you. Finally, I have Coach Jack Newman from Austin Tennis Academy. Jack is an old friend of mine, worked with my son when he was in juniors, and he is out here, I think pretty much every year with a group of kids from Texas. This year is no different, of course. Now enjoy my conversation with Jack. I think the only time of year I ever see you is at Easter Bowl, Jack. So <laughs> it's lovely to see you again. Nice to see you. Thanks for hanging out and waiting for me to get back over to this site because um, I really wanted to chat with you. But sure. how many kids you got here this year? Uh, we've got four. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Which Younger, age groups? Three 12s and one 18. So. And how's everybody doing? Uh, we're still here. So <laughs> if you're still here, it's good. We've got a girl that's uh, in the main draw doubles in the quarters, I think, tonight, and uh, she's still in the back draw of singles, and our boys 18 is still in the back draw of singles, too, and in the main draw doubles still, so awesome. we're here for a few more days. I love it. Let's talk about the back draw a minute, because sure. we know back draw flu is a thing, and as it's been a problem for decades in junior tennis, and I want to just talk about the importance from your perspective as a coach, sure. for these kids to stick around and play the back draw? So the Easter Bowl is arguably the toughest tournament of the year because it's a 64 draw. The other L1s are at smallest of 128 and larger than that. So the quality of competition, uh, if you want to look at ROI, right, your yeah. return on investment, the quality of competition at this tournament is higher than any other tournament. So a back draw match here could be like the round of 64 or the round of 32 at an L1 during the summer. Mm -hmm. So I think that it behooves players and parents to recognize that they're getting a really good return on their investment when they come to the Easter Bowl and they play all the matches that, that, they, that they're capable of playing, that they're eligible to play. Mm -hmm. So I think having parents and players understand that, you know, whether you play somebody who's really good in the first round of the main 
or in the third round of the back, you're still playing somebody who's really good. And yeah. that experience is what's going to help you be better. And what do you tell your players when they lose their main draw? They're understandably disappointed that they've, they're now out of the main draw. What do you say to them as a coach to help get them in the right mindset to compete in the back draw? Sure, well, it's probably a little bit different talking to a girl's 12 than it is talking to a boy's 18s. Yes. So with a girl's 12 or boy's 12, it's really about the emotions of it and managing the emotions of, of loss and, and that you know, you've got to live to battle another day and you've got more opportunity and, and really build the positiveness of that. With the older players, you know, uh, if we're charting the match, we get to go over the data and look at what happened and, and make some adjustments for the next day. And that happened today. The boy that I'm here with lost in his first match. We had some great data from the charting and we made some adjustments today and he played much better and won today um, because of those adjustments. And he was very mature yesterday about taking that input. Um, you know, these are guys that are getting close to college and. You know, they're men and women rather than boys and girls. And so you can treat them and talk to them a little bit more like a professional athlete rather than a little kid. Mm -hmm. And to the parents who were saying, you know, it's costing me a thousand dollars a day to be here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just ready to go home. How do you explain it to them? Well, I think you got to do selling on the front end, right? You got to do pre-selling. So the pre-selling is, look, Easter Bowl is a four day tournament no matter what. I mean, any which way you slice it, you're probably going to be there four days. And so budget for four days, plan on four days. If it ends up being less than four days or, or less than your budget, great. But I think that if you help players and parents understand, you know, if you have a yearly budget and this is part of the yearly budget and you're going to budget four days, if you go more than four days, I've really never seen anybody unhappy with that, right? right. The budget can be busted if we're here extra or, or further longer than we thought we were going to be. Yeah. Um, so I think pre-selling is really important. And then, you know, just understanding it's part of the process. And, and again, the ROI for this tournament is is higher for than other tournaments. Right. And your kids that are playing here, let's let's first talk about the, the ones in the 12 and unders. Is how do you prepare them mentally for you guys are in Texas for traveling this far to come compete that adds a level of pressure kids get it that their parents are spending a lot of money and taking time off work and all that so how is how do you have that conversation with them so they don't freak out before they get here and uh, put so much pressure on themselves so we don't talk about it it's just another tournament. It's just another, all of the kids that are at the Easter Bowl have played many L1s already, have played many L2s already, have played many L3s, have played their, you know, sectional championship. They're, they're pretty seasoned, even at 12, they're pretty seasoned. So I don't really get into that. Most of the younger kids travel with their parents mm -hmm. rather than with the team. So, so we don't really get into that too much. I, I think that the preparation is, it's just another tournament and we're going to get as good experience as we can. We're trying to do exactly the same things here that we do in practice every day. And that was really with, I was coaching a player uh, in a split sets situation and she's an extremely mature 12 and under players and she was crying. And, and I said, look, the number one asset that you bring to this tournament is your maturity and you're throwing it away by getting upset and crying and, and, and you know, being emotional. I said, you have to calm down and you have to use your maturity as a weapon in this match because the other person's falling apart too, right? You're both falling apart. And so if you stop falling apart, you're going to win this match. Mm -hmm. And she did. And it was, you know, it was a great experience. I love that. I, that's, that's a great call. I've never heard it put quite like that. Yeah. Um, I love that. And so, and with the older kids, again, you know, they're taking time away. I guess for some of them, they're on spring break right now anyway, because yeah. um, it's Easter weekend coming up. But for the ones that are missing school, missing events at home, um, this is a longer tournament yeah. than the usual USTA event. Pre-planning, right? Talk to all your teachers, get all your assignments done ahead of time that you can. Make sure you touch base with your teachers if you're in school. Make sure that they know that you care about their class. Uh, talk to your classmates, your teammates. Make sure you're getting data from class if, if class is met. And then follow up each day with your teachers. Let them know how you did in the tournament so, you, you know, so they have a vested interest in what you're doing, right? They, yeah. they involve them and, and make them part of your team. And so our students are really 
well trained in communication skills, right? Make sure you're communicating a lot with your teachers while you're gone and, and do that ahead of time. Let them know ahead of time how long you're going to be gone and prepare them for the worst, right? I'm going to be gone the whole week. Yeah. And if you're back on Wednesday, great. <laughs> well, not really. Not great for you, but <laughs> maybe great for them. Yeah. Um, so the older kids, again, the ones that are getting ready to go to college, yeah. what value do you see in an an event like this for kids that are headed to play college tennis in the fall? Sure, well, so if you're going, if you're senior and you're already made your decision on where you're going and all that, it's a, you know, it's a free tournament, right? There's no pressure, there's no stress. If you're still in the college process, mm -hmm you're still trying to produce results, you're still trying to show coaches the level that you're capable of producing. So there's, there is a quite a bit of pressure on those kids in 18s who are juniors or, or younger trying to show coaches. So with them, it's just like, look, you're gonna face this pressure when you go to college, you're gonna play. You know, the thing that we talk a lot about is, what do you look like in your backdraw match, right? Yeah. Because in college, you might play a match on Saturday and then a match on Sunday, or you might play a match Sunday morning and then a match Sunday night. Right. And so you got to be able to bounce back and you got to be able to show the coach that, that he can trust you to be in the match if you lost your first match, right? Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's a real challenge for players in an individual sport. When you get thrown into that team situation where, hey, I need you to be ready for that second match, even though you lost your first match, the team won. Yeah. Get excited, right? We won, the, we won the dual match. Now you need to be ready for the second match of the day. That's a great, great point, and I love that you bring that up of kind of that bouncing back and understanding that it's not just about you in the moment. You know, it is, but well, in college, a bigger... in college tennis, there's a bigger picture. Yes. And you're playing for your teammates, and you're playing for your coach, and you're playing for your school. So your resiliency has to be even better. Yeah. You're here with a group. How do you manage the different kids' needs? The one, does everybody have a parent with them? Or? No. Okay. Uh, the younger ones have their parents here, the older ones with me. Okay. So, and, and normally we'd have three or four older ones as a group, and we might have two coaches here, but yeah. since we only have one, we had a number of kids who just missed the cutoff this year. So um, we'll, we'll have a bigger group next year, yeah. I think. Um, I think that if we have a group of players uh, that I'm responsible for, Obviously, we're trying to facilitate everybody's warm-up, facilitate everybody eating, facilitate everybody's uh, debrief after their matches. Um, luckily, we have a lot of great coaches at ATA, and I'm not the primary coach of every kid. So those kids are communicating with their primary coaches after their matches, and um, you know, they might even call them on a split sets instead okay. of me if I'm not there. Yeah. Or I might be here, and I coach some kids that aren't my primary students but who are part of our program, and you know, after that, updated those coaches their primary coach on what I said and what they did and what I thought they could work on and so there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, logistics and juggling you know as I told you we got an Airbnb right across the street so that saves us time and energy breakfast is not a problem right because we can cook right. our own and so those sorts of things if you have four or five or six kids that makes a real difference yeah yeah for sure and it's you know it's a challenge because there are a lot of different sites this year um, not everything is at Indian Wells Tennis Garden um, even this far along in the tournament and so you are one person <laughs> yeah well I think the tournament did a good job of staggering the 12s and 14s and the 16s and 18s so, mm -hmm. so that I think was very helpful and, and I think that having a lot of sites and having good sites you know there's a lot of great sites that the kids are playing at oh yeah even though you know anybody who doesn't play at the tennis gardens is disappointed there are some great sites that they're playing at here in, in the palm springs area yeah oh it's gorgeous out here so because they staggered the start of the tournament have you been here since last uh, friday i flew in with the older boy on uh saturday morning early okay so we could do a practice saturday two practices on sunday and i could catch some of the younger kids matches okay so the younger kids were here just with parents on friday oh, yeah okay got and it, then got they it, started got it. on saturday got it um what's your next event that you're traveling to with these kids uh next event for me will probably be one of our sectional tournaments okay. we'll have a group of 20 or 30 or 40 kids going Oof. to a, a l4 i think in april um and then uh summer grand slam you know our big sectional tournament in june will be, yeah. be a big event as well love that in between all that, you're going to be presenting at our virtual conference. Yeah, in I'm June. very excited about that. And so I, I interviewed another coach that's going to be presenting too and asked him to give a little teaser about what 
we're going to be discussing at the conference. So sure. Do you want to do that? Yeah, sure. So I think Billy Pate and I are going to yep. uh, co collaborate on a presentation on the college process, recruiting. Uh, I'm going to talk from my end, from the junior tennis coaching end. He's going to talk from his end, the, the you know, the, the seller and the buyer maybe is the way to think about that, right? <laughs> um, and who's which you'll have to figure out. Yeah. But yeah, uh, talking about the process starting when kids are freshmen and sophomore, all the way through their senior year and, and their signing ceremonies and, you know, all of the things that happen in between and, and how you navigate all of that. I love that. I, we're so excited that you said yes. And we have this great event planned. I hope everybody listening to this is going to sign up. It's June 9th. Um, you can check all of the Parenting Aces social media for information. And if you need more information, you can always contact me directly, Lisa, at parentingaces.com. But um, Jack, it's always such a pleasure to see you, and I wish your kids all the success. Who do you got going to college in the fall? How many? Uh, so we've got Jack Ingram headed to Vanderbilt University. Nice. Excited about that. We've got a young a lady, um, Kendall Cedar, who's headed to Trinity in Connecticut, cool. which is another great place. And we've actually got a couple still working on their uh, process. They're just finishing up the regular decision uh, acceptances. Yeah. And then Ross Cockrell is headed to Colorado College and uh, Tucker Taylor is headed to, my mind just went blank, it's on the East Coast, it's a great, got a great biology, uh, marine biology department. Oh, cool. Um, it'll come to me when we, as soon as we're <laughs> yeah, done. As, as soon as but, we're finished, of yeah, course. Yeah, we've, we've had a really great uh, signing season and looking forward to it. So, I, it's very interesting, so you have two kids that are still in the process and I want to just point that out because people start to panic this time of year and they sure. think oh my gosh I haven't signed it anywhere I'm never gonna get to play college tennis that's not true yeah I think again tennis is an individual sport and the process for choosing your college experience is also individual you know some kids have a very clear picture of what they're looking for and can kind of narrow down a little bit earlier maybe and other kids have absolutely no idea what they're um, capable of or what what they're what is available to them and you know a lot of uh, tennis kids do early decision early action uh, because colleges want to know that they're going to lock up those athletes other kids go through the regular decision process like every kid in america who's going to college does yeah. and those things are fluid and they're and they're still hearing you know uh, you didn't get in, but you're on the wait list, right? right? And, and so th that wait list can move fast sometimes or slow sometimes. So, uh, you know, those kids that are uh, have some options, but maybe they're waiting for to see if they might get just a little bit better option. You know, all of that's happening still yeah. and, and will for another month probably. And there are still plenty of spots available on college tennis teams. Yep. There are coaches still looking for players for the fall. And I think that's another thing that um, people maybe don't understand is that that's also a fluid process. Yeah. Um, Coaches don't always know how many of their players are going to be returning. Um, you know, we're, we're through the COVID extra year pretty much, so coaches aren't having to deal with that as much. Right. But there's still a little bit of that in the system, and, and there's still, you know, quite a few kids um, in the transfer portal that coaches can look at. And so I think, yeah, it's, it's a very fluid situation and a challenging one for sure. Yeah, so the bottom line is don't give up hope. They're... If you haven't signed on the dotted line yet, doesn't mean you're not gonna at some point before August, September. And if you don't get the choices you want and you wanna do a gap year, that's also an option out there. Yeah. And a lot of people get scared of that option. I We've used it successfully with a lot of players where they work on their school still, they work on their academics, they work on their tennis, they work on their physicality, they work on their um, tournament experience. And um, sometimes they do some great internships during that gap year. So that's an opportunity that, that exists for people too. That if you don't get the, the um, exact pick that you wanted, you can take an extra year. And, and um, no one who's gone to school at 19 has done worse than someone who went at 18, yeah, right? <laughs> exactly. Great information to share, absolutely. Jack, great seeing you. Wish everybody all the best and look forward to seeing you at the next one. See you guys at the conference. Yeah. Thank you all so much for tuning in. We will be back to business as usual next week. But for now, appreciate you. Be sure to sign up to follow us on all our social media channels. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast. And don't forget about our upcoming virtual conference June 9th. More information coming soon, but it's going to be a great one. Have a great week, everybody.